right, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we are in applying the cell of origin uh, in clinical trials uh, in large cell lymphoma. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of overview of that, and then I have one main punchline that is that this might not work, or at least it might not work anytime soon, and you'll have to wait a few minutes to hear why, but I'm going to throw this out here as a thought uh, and maybe some discussion. So uh, first disclosures. So we all know uh, very well that in large cell lymphoma, we're trying to cure patients. We have good prognostic tools. I'll remind you that the IPI, which has been around a lot longer than cell of origin as a prognostic tool, uh, has not impacted choice of therapy uh, by any randomized trial so far in a meaningful way. Uh, and so we need to be a little bit skeptical that changing our therapeutic approach on any other prognostic information that we have may not turn into something that uh, acting upon it helps patients. Uh, we're obviously hopeful, but we should be a little skeptical too. Uh, most patients, as you've heard and know, are treated the same with our CHOP, although uh, our EPOC is a regimen that's being studied and is sometimes used. Obviously, the goal of therapy or the, the challenge in large cell lymphoma, as you saw from the data Laurie presented, 60% uh, of patients are cured, and I think she showed you data uh, from a large kind of population-based uh, analysis, and we'll come back to, to that in just a, a minute in, in, as I get to one of my points. Um, but we obviously need to cure more patients, reduce toxicity. And so the question uh, of this talk and the next talk is shall we use some of this information to treat patients differently? Adam's going to talk about the double hit, double protein. I'm going to talk about the germinal center, non-germinal center, or activated B cell subtype. Uh, and the reason that we'd like to get this right up front is that if these patients relapse, uh, it's a challenge to cure them. So this is our algorithm for large cell lymphoma. You know this well. Um, patients get r -CHOP typically, and we hope to cure them. And uh, if they relapse, they need more chemotherapy and hopefully can be cured with an autotransplant, although that's a minority of patients. So I'm going to focus on the upfront setting and where we're looking at cell of origin. I'll come back to the relapse setting uh, a little bit later. <coughs> so this is a study that's been going on for some time. Uh, over 12 years now at this point. We're waiting for the results. Hopefully, uh, well, I expect we will have them this coming year where we're looking at patients with large cell lymphoma, coming year meaning next year, uh, and randomly assigned to our CHOP versus our EPOC. And they are uh, essentially, we're comparing those two regimens. Every patient is getting uh, kind of uh, the, the now uh, understood or uh, recognized uh, gene expression profiling, as well as a variety of other molecular analyses to try to tease out um, what holds up in, in this sort of study and uh, does one regimen perform better than another in these different molecular subsets. And the topic or the issue uh, of this talk is really focused on uh, the germinal center, non-germinal center, or germinal center activated B cell subtype, again, depending on how you're doing the assay, and has largely been prompted uh, by uh, studies like this one that took patients that had been treated with RCHOP and showed that there was a difference in outcome based on cell of origin. And I want to point out two things that are important both in this study uh, and uh, the others that are out there. So the first is that you see that the ABC subtype by molecular profiling, gene signatures here, had a, more or less a 40% cure rate. So I'm going to remind you of that number. You see that the germinal center is about 80% cure rate. And the other point uh, really that I, that I want to make is that this was, if I'm not mistaken, a retrospective analysis. These were patients that were treated that got their R-CHOP, then the investigators went, got the tissue, did the gene expression profiling, putting them into two groups. I'm looking at Randy to confirm this. Uh, and that's how they did. So it was a retrospective molecular analysis of a population of patients treated with R-CHOP. We'll come back to this in a few minutes, OK? So why is it that one would expect that these two different subtypes 
do differently and could be targeted differently? Well, because it's been associated that there are a variety of different targets and, and oncogenic mechanisms, you heard about these in some of the talks earlier today, uh, the germinal center subtype with a variety of mechanisms I'm not going to go into, as well as the ABC subtype and a variety of mutations there. And now we have more and more drugs, you heard about some earlier, that might be applicable to these particular areas, and I'll focus on a couple in just a minute. So how would we, going back to the question of how would we use this, well, if we wanted to prove that a drug or a targeted drug helped a subset of patients, we would have to do a study like this. We would have to say, okay, we've got our two subsets, and we're going to use something else in subset one and in subset two, and compare those two approaches in subset one or subset two. Uh, we really need to do this in a prospective way to show that our targeted drug would make a difference. And so here's an example uh, of how this is being done. This is uh, uh, a, an example of, and this is one way, there are several I'll take you through. Large cell lymphoma patients, in this case using the immunohistochemistry surrogate, uh, the Hans method here, to identify the non-germinal center subset. And then the idea being of substituting in, or adding in, I should say, not entirely substituting, two doses of bortezomib that has a variety of preclinical and some clinical rationale to use in that non-germinal center subtype and comparing it to the standard art shop. So this is one, one study, one approach, and we'll come back to this in a second. There is another study, another approach. This is going on largely in Great Britain where basically everyone who walks in the door gets a biopsy, everyone gets our chop, everyone on the study, then the patients are randomized to get our chop with bortezomib or our chop alone, and the idea is that they're getting molecular profiling uh, once they've already gotten, gotten the therapy and looking at that subtype. So the idea is that in this study, everybody walks in the door, gets started, okay, one difference. Number two, uh, everyone, oh, well, no one gets the experimental therapy with the first cycle. That may or may not make a difference. We tend to think first cycle is important, but here everybody's getting standard therapy with the first cycle, not the bortezomib. And then the patient goes on to get treated and we're looking at the subsets, which that information comes in once the patient's already on therapy. But again, they continue on their therapy and the different subsets will be looked at. So a different design to this, this study. And again, it's gonna, gonna got its own set of pluses and its own set of minuses. And we'll see how that goes. That, that study is moving along. So what are the other approaches? What are the other drugs that are being looked at? Well, <coughs> excuse me, as you know, uh, and you've seen versions of this, I think, from Randy's talk earlier and, and others, uh, the ABC subtype seems to have uh, a lot of activation of signaling pathways associated with B-cell receptor signaling, and so target, using a drug that targets this pathway or these associated pathways makes sense to pursue in this ABC subtype. We know that a brutinib, which you're familiar with, targets uh, brutin's tyrosine kinase and B-cell receptor signaling. It turns out that uh, ibrutinib has activity as a single agent in relapsed ABC or non-GCB, depending on the assay subtype. And so again, there's single agent activity in this particular subtype. And it turns out that Anasunis has done, and others have done a study of adding RCHOP to ibrutinib, showing that you can give them together safely and that um, the results look pretty good. It's tolerable, but again, this was a phase one trial. You're not gonna draw big conclusions other than safety. So the trial design, which has uh, been pursued here, is to essentially do what I described earlier, but in a specific way, identify the non-germinal center subtype where you think a brutinib may have an impact, in this case by immunohistochemistry, and randomize patients to RCHOP order a brutinib chop, And that study has been done. It's completed accrual, I believe, uh, and is an analysis. So we'll see how that works. But again, my teaser, it might not work. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. On the other hand, we have other drugs that can target the ABC subtype. And uh, one of those is lenalidomide. And there are a variety of other signaling pathways, as you see summarized here, that lenalidomide is nicely uh, plopped in the middle here is potentially affecting, and we have data similarly to a brutinib that lenalidomide in the relapse setting has single agent activity in the non-germinal center subtype. So again, 
This suggests that lenalidomide might be useful in this patient population, the non-germinal center subtype. And these are data from Greg Nowakowski and the Mayo Group, a study, <coughs> excuse me, of R-squared CHOP, basically lenalidomide R-CHOP, compared to some case match controls showing that patients do better compared to the historical data. Certainly supports the idea that this drug should be pursued and looked at. And when you look at the germinal center subtype and the non-germinal center subtype, and when you look at R-CHOP, you see a big difference. And when you see the R-squared CHOP, you don't see a big difference. Again, suggesting in a retrospective analysis here that um, that this may be a value. So again, you would do the same sort of study, and in fact, that's what's going on. This is the ECOG version. There are other, uh, Celgene also uh, is pursuing this as well, and the idea being that you have R-CHOP versus R-squared CHOP, and again, looking at the subsets or potentially selecting a subset uh, to look at this combination in, okay? So, where does that put us right now? Well, if we want to use this cell of origin to essentially divide the, the group of large cell lymphoma patients on this basis and treat them differently or study, study the idea of treating them differently, then there have to be a few different things that you take into consideration. <clears throat> One is that you need to be able to identify the subset. And you heard a little bit earlier from Randy, again, we can do the immunohistochemistry, you can do gene expression profiling, we have nanostring, other techniques that may be helpful there. But you have to be able to do this reliably and quickly. Then the question is, does the drug work and does it work in this specific subset? Is it a specific drug for this subtype of lymphoma or not? Is this specificity of the drug, if you believe that abrutinib or lenalidomide or something else specifically works in this subtype, does that hold if you're giving it with this gamish of chemotherapy? Maybe, maybe not. We need to know that. And then finally, do we have enough patients to enroll a subtype, recognizing that, that you start out with 100 patients and, and patients, uh, when you look at subsets, you may not have enough to do randomized trials or it's going to take you longer or be harder to do. Okay. So what lesson do I have and what is my punchline about the challenge here? So we have one study. It was briefly alluded to uh, earlier today, but not in any detail. And this has just been, been published in blood uh, very recently. And this took patients with, again, screen patients, took the non-germinal center subtype by immunohistochemistry, randomly assigned them to uh, bortezomib, plugged in for vincristine in the R-CHOP versus R-CHOP alone. You see the general schema. Not that different, a little bit different, but not that different from the one I showed you earlier. And this has been published uh, in blood, as I said. And here's the schema. I'm not sure how well you can read this, but I want to make a point. So there were 300. I'll read the numbers for you. At the very top box, how many patients were screened here? 364 patients. Then a number were looked at by IHC. Then a number were looked at non-GCB. Then a number were randomized. So you go from 364 patients screened, you go through this process, and you end up with 164 patients randomized. And the reason that patients didn't uh, go on the study or didn't get randomized and treated is issues around getting the tissue, around the IHC, that was in 20 patients, excluded because they had the wrong subtype. That was 70 percent of pa 70 patients, not 70 percent. That's not a surprise. You're going to exclude some patients. About 30 patients didn't get randomized for a variety of different reasons. And you can, I'm sorry, this is small, but you can look at the paper. It's in blood. But the point is that this whole process of identifying a patient and then randomizing the patient and putting them on the study, you lose the majority of patients, okay? You lose the majority of patients. So, what were the results of this study? And I'll come back to why you might lose many patients along the way, even before you start this algorithm. So these are the results of the study. And basically, progression-free survival in both arms, and this is, the scale only goes down to 50, so it looks worse than it really is, is about 80%. Two-year progression-free survival in both arms, about 80%, and these curves look quite similar, okay? So you might say that this is a negative study because there's no difference, there's no advantage. So let's look. I showed you the lens paper before, and then I showed you this paper. So the retrospective study with lens, 
that ABC, by gene expression profiling with our CHOP, retrospectively, two-year progression-free survival with our CHOP, 40%. Now the curve on the right, the prospective study, non-germinal center by IHC, with our CHOP, 80%. So the control arm in these two different series, 40% more or less cure rate, 80% more or less cure rate, same treatment. Different patients, clearly they have to be different patients, okay? So what are the reasons for this? What are the potential reasons for this? Well, one aspect of why the study may have been negative is that bortezomib is not a, doesn't do what we thought it did. And that's certainly a possibility, just like a brutinib might not do what we think it is or, or will do or lenalidomide might not. The assay to split the subsets might not be so robust, might not work. One was gene expression profiling. In this study, we had IHC. So in fact, in the Offner study, they looked at a subset of the patients, and what they saw was that they were concordant 90% of the time. So the IHC and gene expression profiling, and you can see it in the paper, were concordant 90% of the time. So not perfect, but, but pretty good. Probably not the big issue. I think the issue here is patient selection. When you do a prospective study, you have patient selection. The time involved in identifying the subset, remember the LENS study was retrospective. So those patients got treated whenever they got treated. They went to the freezer, got the tissue, looked at the tissue, and it was there. To go on one of these prospective studies, a lot of steps have to happen before. What happens to the patient population over the course of time of putting a patient on these prospective studies, bad patients fall off, right? Imagine, you're sitting there in your clinic, you propose, maybe the patient's coming to you for a second opinion, they've already had this diagnosis for a week or two, they're worried, they say, oh, you have a curable disease, but it's scary, it's aggressive, you need treatment, it's our CHOP, okay. Well, we have a clinical trial, all these exciting new drugs, okay, what's gonna happen? Well. Will you consent? Well, let me think about it. Well, are you eligible? Let me draw your blood. Let me wait a day or two. Let me get your tissue. I don't have your tissue yet. I have to get your tissue. Then I have to send it off to the central lab. Well, the central lab, when are we going to get the answer? Oh, in a few days. Okay, then the lab comes back. Meanwhile, that patient's on pins and needles for a week, two weeks, in limbo. Okay, what happens? That patient's sick, that patient's worried. You know, that patient says, no, thank you, I'm not going on the study. So what happens? Bad patients, sick patients who could benefit from this intervention don't go on the study. Guess what happens? The control group has an 80% PFS, better than what Laurie showed you for the whole population of 60%. That was the whole population, British Columbia, 60% cure rate. Here, this study, this is supposed to be the bad lymphoma. It's 80% cure rate. Pretty good. So that's a problem. That's a big problem in these studies. So that, I think, is a reason why these studies, these drugs may work perfectly well, but these studies may be negative. And the assays may work perfectly well, but the studies may be negative. So we're going to have to figure this out one way or another. So I just want to end with one other thought. It's a different setting, but another approach is in the relapse setting. And this is a little bit easier because you have a little more time, perhaps, in the relapse setting. And I'm just going to show you, and I'm not saying this is better, it's just different. And for complete lists, I want to show you one other study that's going on. This is an intergroup study uh, being done uh, that's in development right now. It's approved and going forward. This is in the relapse setting, taking the ABC subtype, identifying the patients by, by nanostring technology, so a molecular assay. These are relapse patients. They relapse, they get their second line therapy, they get an auto transplant with or without, in this case, a brutinib, and they get a year of a brutinib afterwards. So again, it's a relapse setting, it's a different scenario, but again, it's this subtype, and the patient selection issue should be less, because why? These patients can go on the study, they can get their therapy, all of that takes place while the patient uh, is getting their analysis done, so hopefully there's much less patient selection there and then we can see if the abrutinib helps there. So it's a different scenario. I think some of that problem will be ameliorated, but again, we'd like to really implement the strategy up front, and we have to deal with the challenges that I mentioned. So this is my last slide. I think we have to be very cautious. It's exciting, this cell of origin data, but it comes down to did the drugs that we're plugging in for these patients work? 
Can we identify them in a subset in a, in a robust fashion? I think we're, we have the tools and we're getting better tools to do that. But I think this patient selection issue is a big issue that can profoundly influence in a negative way our clinical trials and might falsely lead us to think that these strategies don't work. Thanks very much.